Well, like Judy said, um, I'm an astrophotographer. I do deep sky astrophotography and I've been doing it f since 2017. Uh, so it, it'll be like four years going into August, I think, that since I started. And these are just two of my pictures I've taken from Newark um, using a fairly modest setup. Um, so I'll get right into it. So astrophotography, it's just you take pictures of astronomical objects and well, you do it more so for like the artistic aspect of it, more like just to wow people, wow your friends and family, rather than to gather like scientific data. Not to say like there isn't, isn't any like scientific data in there, but it's mostly just to, you know, get a pretty picture out, out of it. Okay. And so there, there are just a couple subsets. So I got lunar, I got planetary, solar, and deep sky, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I started with planetary and lunar. That's how I got into it, how I got sucked into the rabbit hole. Just... Cool. I had the, I was like, oh, what if I just put my iPhone up to the eyepiece and take a picture? Um, little did I know that was maybe a bad idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like that, that cascaded into, I got a, like a cheap webcam like camera to take pictures of the planets and, and the moon. And so I did that for a while, got kind of bored. And I'm like, well, what else can I do? And so I learned that it actually is possible to do deep sky from light polluted skies like in Newark. I, 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 previously, I, th I thought it was like, oh, it's like a waste of time. Don't even try. But I was quite wrong. So. Um, so just some differences between like solar system and deep sky. Planets are small. So you need a uh, focal length. You need a pretty high magnification if you want to see any surface details. And they're bright. So, you know, may maybe an exposure you take is like on the magnitude of like minutes. And each sub exposure is like milliseconds. And what you essentially do is you take a video. And because you're at such a high magnification, the atmosphere gets in the way. And so a lot of the frames are absolute crap. And so you just toss them and keep like, I don't know, 20% of the best. And then you stack them and you're left with one pretty clear image at the end, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but for a deep sky, you know, the objects are quite big, you know, on the scale of degrees possibly but they're really dim. And so really the total exposure time for an image is like on the scale of hours. And you know, uh, each sub exposure is like minutes. So typically I, my sub exposures are like three to five minutes, depending on how bright it is, depending on if my guiding's crap or not. <laughs> if my guiding's bad, I'm gonna do like a shorter exposure just to make up for it. But so longer exposures and typically since they're big, you don't really want a huge magnification. You don't want a telescope with a large focal length at least for beginners you want something with a shorter focal length you get a wider field of view it's more forgiving you can find stuff easier um, so yeah um, what you need first of all is a camera and what I started with when I started deep sky astrophotography is a DSLR because they're cheap a lot of people already have one um, and they're pretty easy to use when I got mine I was like I don't know how this thing works because <laughs> I never really used a DSLR before but it's nice because you got buttons. It has an LCD screen on the back. So I would, I would just put on the live view and then look at a bright star and then up oh, the bright stars on the back of the LCD screen. And I can just focus, focus the, uh, the telescope that way just by eyeballing it on the LCD screen. Um, what I did to control it was I, I plugged it into a laptop um, and then I used uh, acquisition software to control it. I'll talk about that later, but Technically, with a DSLR, you don't even need a telescope in the first place because a camera lens will do the job. And, you know, camera lenses are mobile, the DSLR is mobile, and they make mobile mounts too. So DSLRs have the advantage of being mobile friendly. You can just take that thing out to a, a dark sky site, not have to worry about lugging a crap ton of equipment around. Um, I never really did that. I never really got out to a deep sky site yet. I've been wanting to, but so I haven't really had a need of a mobile setup. So I just go out in my front yard and do it. Um, let's see what else. Oh, so um, the SLRs typically have, they, well, they have an APS-C size sensor, which is a pretty big sensor, relatively speaking. And they also have like full-size sensors. It's te technically not a DSLR if it's a full-size sensor, but um, the size of the sensor helps because, you know, the bigger the sensor is, the wider field of view you have. So if you pair a, a DSLR or, or a full-size mirrorless camera, with a wide field, say, refractor telescope, you can get some wide angle shots. And that's, that's pretty good. You can include multiple objects in there to, you know, wow people. And you can also easily find objects. So if you're just 
not so if you're a beginner and you're not so great at navig navigating the sky, uh, you don't. It's pretty easy to find objects with that wide field of view. But there are some downsides to DSLRs. Mainly, the first one is that out, out of the factory, these these DSLRs they have a, a it's called a stock IR cut filter, UV IR cut filter, and so what that does, well, it cuts out the higher wavelengths that start at UV, and then it cuts it begins to cut out redder wavelengths into the infrared, and that's not good because a lot of objects in the night sky, mainly uh, nebulae, H2 regions, they emit light, emit most of their light at 656 nanometers, which is the, of course, the H alpha line, very red. And as you can see in this figure here with the, the yellow curve, which is the, this is a transmission curve of the stock UV IR cut filter in a, in a stock uh, DSLR. You're only getting about like, let's see, like maybe like 20% of like the H2, the H alpha light. And so if you take a picture of an H2 region with a DSLR, you, you might be disappointed because it, it won't pop out like you'd expect just because you're, you're, you're crutching yourself just based on the fact that you're only getting 20% of the light. And so typically what, what these people do is you, you can get it modified. So you can either take the th DSLR apart yourself or you have to get to the sensor and take off the sensor or you can get someone else to do it for you. I paid someone else to modify mine. They took, they took the stock filter out. They put a new one in, which let more H alpha light in. And so I never took a picture of an H2 region with a stock DSLR. So I don't know what it was like. I never wanted to try it. So I, I can't really compare, but I've seen pictures where it's like, you don't get a whole lot of a, a light from a nebula if you, t if you use a stock DSLR. But there are better why, options. Why, yeah. why, why, why would the, uh, an astronomical filter be so, is it hard for them to construct them so that they let through the H alpha light? Well, well it's because um, DSLRs, they're not made for um, astrophotography. They're mm -hmm. made for daytime photography. And so I guess there isn't a lot of like really red light in daytime photography. And so, yeah. you know, they're just made for terrestrial stuff. And oh. so, yeah. Okay. It's not that they're hard to make, it's just that they're not DSLRs, they're made for daytime, not, not um, astrophotography. So there's a better option if <laughs> you have the money for it. But so we have dedicated astronomy cameras. They don't come with that stock IR cut filter in front of the sensor like DSLRs. In fact, they don't have any filters in front of them at all. Um, but the main thing that makes these superior, I think, to DSLRs is that they have cooling abilities. So they just, you have a Peltier device on it. You run current through it. One side gets cold, the other gets hot. You put the cold side to the sensor and put a fan on the hot side to blow out the heat. And so with more moderate um, astronomy cameras, you can cool it to 40 below ambient temperature, 40 C below ambient. That's, at least that's the one I have right now. And so, you know, that helps. In the summer, I cool it down to minus 10 C. In the winter, I cool it down to minus 20. I could probably push it further. I just don't want to um, because I use a battery to actually cool it. Um, if maybe if I were getting wall power, I would push it to minus 50 in the winter or something like that. But anyway, so one good thing about being able to cool it is that of course you get heat noise in cameras. The hotter your um, sensor is, the more heat noise it'll get just because it can detect some of that thermal heat com coming from the sensor itself. And so if you cool it, you don't have to deal with heat noise in the first place. There are ways to get heat noise out via calibration frames, but a lot of the time it's just easier not to deal with it at all. And so by cooling it, forget about heat noise somewhat. Um, also, so with calibration frames, dark, dark frames remove heat noise. Um, and so as such, your dark frames, which are taken at the same exposure time as your light frames with the lens cap on, so you're not capturing any light, to expose heat noise and whatnot. Um, you can take dark frames um, like during the day in your house. You just cool the camera in your house and take a dark frame. With DSLRs, you don't have that luxury since you can't control the temperature. You have to take your dark frames at during or after your imaging session so that the sensor is the same temperature as it was when you took your light frames. And that's just really lame. You, like you have your setup outside and you're taking nothing here <laughs> you're, you're, you're taking dark frames no light at all it's kind of lame 
And so with this, I can, I, it's called a dark library. I just create a dark library at a certain temperature and exposure time and I have them forever and I don't have to worry about it at all. So I can dedicate all of my time at night taking images, not have to worry about, not like take into account darks. Um, that with dedicated astronomy cameras, you can, you can have them with color or monochrome. So with one shot color cameras, um, the benefit is that you get a, a color image in one shot. The, the downside is, is that you're right and you're sacrificing detail. Since on the sensor you have a Bayer pattern and like in a two by two array of pixels, say you have, on my camera at least, you have two green pixels, one blue and one red. So you're separating up the light and the colors. You're separating it and that's not really good because you know the red pixel will basically ignore the blue and the green light. You're throwing a third of it away. Approximately, that's probably not totally correct. But, and with monochrome, you don't have that Bayer pattern. So you're getting, you're just measuring intensity. You're getting all the light hitting. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, the color does not matter at all. But the downside is, if you want to consider it a downside, is you're left with a black and white image, which I guess isn't as impressive as a color image. Uh, of course, there are ways to get color images with monochrome cameras. Um, dedicated astronomy cameras, you have the option of a CCD or CMOS. Um, with CCD, I guess you could still say they're more sensitive than CMOS cameras but the write-off time is slow on the computer. So with CMOS, they're faster. And maybe if this were 10 years ago, I would say that they're like way, um, way less sensitive than CCD. But nowadays that's becoming less true. CMOS sensors are really catching up to CCD. Um, oh, and um, dedicated astronomy cameras. Yeah, they're not as user-friendly as DSLRs. You don't have an LCD screen. You can't look at a bright star in real time and focus that way. I'm limited to like the, the fastest feed I can get is like one frame per second and focusing a star at one frame per second is really bad. It's not practical or easy to do. So I have to resort to another way to focus. Um, and you need a computer operative. So you can't just take one out with no computer and expect to take pictures. It's not going to work. And just as a joke, they have weird complicated names. It's, such as ZW, ZWO ASI 294MC Pro. That's the one I have. It's a bit of a mouthful, but anyway. So you need something that focuses light. So I probably don't need to talk about this too much, but I use a refractor just because that's what I started with with Deep Sky. I started with a, a fairly wide field refractor just so I could find objects fairly easily and they're, you don't have to uh, maintain them as much as say reflectors because with the lenses they're aligned in the factory and they stay aligned unless you drop the telescope but so you don't have to worry about collimation alignment of the optics um and it's like yeah they're they're, they're wide field so easy to find objects um let's see what else um yeah that's about it so they have downsides um mainly the the first one that comes to mind is that they you have to get a really high quality refractor if you want to do some deep sky astrophotography with it. Because a cheaper refractor, say with one or two lenses, is going to suffer from chromatic aberration where all, all the colors don't align at the same focal point. Um, and so as a result, you get like blue fringes or red or green fringes, such as in this picture of the moon, you see the chromatic aberration. That'll happen to your stars. You'll get like purple halos around your stars. It's really not good. Um, that's if you image with a it's called an achromatic refractor and so the way to fix this is just add, oh add a third lens and that fixes the problem it's called apochromatic but with three lenses you're getting it's going to get expensive quick um, and so that's a downside is that apochromatic refractors the high quality ones you want to use for astrophotography are just expensive and they get expensive quick with aperture so the I have I use a five inch apochromatic refractor and like the MSRP is like two thousand bucks but I got it used luckily so and uh, so the the biggest refractor I've seen the biggest apochromatic refractor I've seen on the market is like six and a half inches and it's twelve thousand dollars so I'll skip out on that one I might rather go to a reflector at that point if I want to go bigger than five inches um, and also. Since the lenses are curved, they suffer from field curvature, so you can get a field flattener to correct that. And reflectors, so reflectors, they use mirrors, so um, easier to make than lenses, and they're supported in the back, so you can get, you can make them bigger for um, a cheaper cost. And 
downside is you need to make sure that the primary mirror and the secondary mirror are aligned or else it's like you can't get the thing in focus. It's out of the collimation. Um, and then you got hybrid. Um, so typically with hybrid, you get a lot of focal length. Um, so they're good for smaller objects like galaxies. Higher focal length, of course, um, translates to higher magnification. That's not always the case because you have these things called RASAs, which I think are kind of cool. Ro Ackerman, Schmidt ast astrograph. Um, you get a large aperture, but a fairly small uh, focal length. And so their focal ratio is pretty low. I think with the RASAs you can buy, they're like F2. So they're fast, which means they can gather light quickly. Um, some people say it's almost like cheating. You can just gather light of dim objects really, really quick. Um, just for reference, the focal ratio of my refractor is 7.5. So 7.5 and 2, quite the difference. I've never used any of these, but though I might, I hear they're kind of easy. Okay, so we have cameras and we have telescopes. And so it's like the question is like, is there a specific pairing of cameras or, or and telescopes you want to use? And so typically there is because you want to consider image scale. Um, so image scale is in units of arc seconds per pixel. And so it's just your pixel size and micrometers divided by your focal length of the telescope in millimeters times 206. There's a factor of 206. I've heard that 206 factor referred to as a magic number. It's not magic at all because, of course, when you divide micrometers by millimeters, you're going to get milliradians. And then there's 206 arc seconds in a milliradian. And so that's where that 206 factor goes, co comes from because you want to convert from milliradians to arc seconds. Um, they're kind of a weird equation, blah, blah. Okay, so there's a one arc second to two arc second rule. This is for the correct image scale. You want to keep it somewhere between uh, one arc second per pixel and two arc seconds per pixel for the optimal resolution. So if you're below one arc second per pixel, you'll start to get oversampling where your stars get bloated. And then if you're over two arc seconds per pixel, you'll get undersampled stars where the stars are blocky. Um, but this, it, it kind of comes down to preference. Um, I've heard people say, oh, image scale doesn't mean anything. You know, it's like, I prefer my picture, pictures undersampled because they look sharp, whatever, right? So um, as, an, as an example, my five inch refractor has a focal length of 951 millimeters. The camera I use has a 4.63 micrometer pixel size. And if you trust my math on this one, that comes about to a, a pixel scale of one arc second per pixel. So I'm on the verge of being oversampled with my setup, though. I, I, it's fine, really. Um, so yeah, below one arc second, oversampled, over two is under. So what you also need is a mount. This is argu arguably the most important thing out of the whole bunch. Um, because you could use a pretty you know, low quality camera and maybe a low quality telescope on a good mount. and get a decent photo out of it. But if your mount doesn't work, if it doesn't work properly, you're not getting anything. You're not taking pictures of anything. So um, one thing when you do deep sky astrophotography, you're doing long exposures, say like three to five minutes. What you, If you have no tracking whatsoever, what you'll see is that, I was like, oh, the earth is rotating because you'll get star trails. And so with astrophotography, you, you'll notice the earth rotating in a three to five minute time period for sure. Um, and luckily, it's the 21st century, we have mounts that are motorized and computerized and they, get, and they can track the sky for us. Um, and so the kind of mount you need is an equatorial mount. So you have right ascension and declination, your two axes. And assuming you align it correctly, you polar align it, you ideally can track the sky on one axis, right ascension. With, um, with astrophotography, that's not really the case. You need to make corrections and declination as well. Um, so you also have um, altitude azimuth mounts, which are just don't even try it for deep sky astrophotography because they're not aligned with the um, axis of rotation of the earth. And so what you'll find if you image an object over the course of, of a night, if you do like, I don't know, five hours made up of three minute sub exposures, you'll find that the, your object actually rotates in the frame relative to the frame. And that's just no good because you're not aligned with the um, axis of rotation of the earth. And so when you go to stack, it'll have to align the frames and it'll rotate and it, you're not gonna get a good image. But with equatorial mounts, that field rotation is just gone since you're aligned um, with the rotation axis of the earth and the object will stay in the same orientation with respect to the frame the whole night. And so that's why you wanna use equatorial mounts. Downside is equatorial mounts, it isn't as easy as just 
moving the thing side to side up and down, it's a bit confusing at first. Um, and you also have to make sure it's polar aligned. You can't just plop the thing down in any direction. You have to make sure it's, um, you have to make sure your right ascension axis is actually pointing at the North Celestial Pole. And that can be tricky um, because, well, you have a thing called a polar alignment scope. This is the mount I have right here. Um, this is the one I use. And in the right ascension axis, at the end of it, you have a built-in polar alignment scope. So you have to get down on your knees and look through this thing. This is what it looks like, this um, reticle. And so it's like a clock. And you put Polaris somewhere in this. Um, depends on the time of day. And so it's, it's trickier than it looks um, at first, like doing it actually in practice. It's actually pretty tricky. And I found doing it a lot, polar lining through the polar alignment scope is there's some guesswork involved. I, I could never really know. It's like, okay, am I like right on the North Celestial Pole for sure? Am I really good polar line? Is it good? So what I did is now I use an electronic polar scope. So I, it's this basically another camera and kind of another telescope, a really small one. You just stick right on top of your right ascension and you use software on your computer and it'll tell you based on like how the stars move, you rotate their, your um, mount in right ascension. Based on how the stars rotate, it'll tell you where Polaris needs to be. So you're smack on right on the North Celestial Pole. And polar alignment is good. It, you need good polar alignment for auto guiding. So you have this fancy mount, you paid a lot of money for it. And the quality of guiding that it can do on its own isn't good enough for um, long exposure deep sky astrophotography. So, and that's mostly because it only guides on right ascension, doesn't do anything in declination. So you're always going to have some error in your polar alignment, no matter what. And if your polar alignment's off, you're going to have error in declination. It's not being corrected for. So what we need to do is now auto guide um, using an auto guiding system. So here's an example setup. This isn't my setup, but you have your main imaging scope here with your camera. And then on piggybacking on top is your auto guiding setup. So you generally have a smaller telescope, different camera. And the job of this setup is just to look at one star throughout the night and just keep that star in the same spot the whole night. And so we have software to do that, luckily. And the the quality of your auto guiding is dependent on your polar alignment. So that's why polar alignment is so important because if your polar alignment's poor, your auto guiding will not help. It'll probably be detrimental because I don't know. It's uh, well, we'll see in a sec. So the software I use for push your dummy is called PHD two it stands for push your dummy. Cause it's supposed to be easy. Apparently um, it's not it. Auto guiding is the thing that always gives me problems uh, during the night because if my auto guiding is bad, I, I need to figure out the problem or else I'm probably not going to get good images, right? If your auto guiding is bad, you'll get trailed stars, oblate stars, not really good because I want, I want pin sharp stars, circular stars. So with PhD2, you pick a star or you can let it pick for you. It has a bunch of tools. You can pick stars. One of the cooler things that PhD2 just implemented is multi-star guiding. So before I, you would just, it would just guide on one star. Now you'll pick like a main star to guide on and then it'll look at other stars in the field and actually use those to guide. So it, I've heard it does like 0.1 um, like arc second better guiding in the air. So it, it's not a substitute for bad polar alignment and it's not like magic, it's gonna work, but it, it helps a little bit anyway. So you pick a star, it'll run a calibration frame, it'll go west to east, and then it'll go north to south. And then based on that calibration, sees how the stars, star moves, it'll get an idea how bad or good your polar alignment is. And then it'll actually start guiding after the calibration setup. This is the UI, so put this in here because this is what my eyes are glued to the whole night, this, this screen right here. Um, so main thing I wanna point out is this graph. So the, the blue line is your right ascension and the red is declination. This is showing corrections made to the, given to the mount that the, so, the software is giving uh, corrections to the mount. Basically, you want this graph to be as flat as possible because that means your guiding good and your polar alignment's good. The spikier it is, the worse. Um, so if, if you're just looking at the guiding and you say, oh, like right ascension just spiked up for some reason, something's probably gone wrong and the image that you're gonna get out of that, the current exposure that will pop out probably isn't so great. You'll probably get um, 
you know, slightly trailed stars. Um, but also, you also have this RMS error. It shows you your error and your right ascension and your error and declination and your total error. And typically, this is in arc seconds, of course. And typically, the rule of thumb is you want your total error to be below one arc second. So, you know, my guiding, it depends. Sometimes it goes slightly above one arc second, but most of the time it stays below because uh, I've been doing it for a while. But at, when I first started, my guiding was like kind of bad. But this isn't my guiding here. This is just what I found on Google Images. And you can see the total error is 0.39 arc seconds. So that, that's really good guiding. Don't even need to worry about it at that point. But there are things that can affect your quality of auto guiding other than your polar alignment. Um, the transparency of the sky, like if the sky is hazy, it can have trouble since the star might not be as bright. And then one thing I, I dealt with a lot this winter was wind. I found that this winter, at least in Newark, was like really windy. and I went out even with the wind and the wind would nudge my telescope and throw my guiding off and ruin exposures. It was very annoying. Um, so other things, maybe, maybe you bump the telescope, maybe you're a bit clumsy. I've done it a, bit a few times before. Oh yeah, and the graph isn't the be all end all because my eyes are glued to the graph, but I've seen, in my time, I've seen some really wacky graphs and I've seen like perfectly fine images. So the, the graph on PhD two isn't the be all end all. The quality of your images is. Um, so your other thing is your acquisition software. So this is basically your control panel for your, your, the whole operation. Um, there's a whole lot out there. I use some, I use one called astrophotography tool. So it allows me to connect to my camera. It allows me to cool my camera and it shows you your sub exposures as they come through. And it allows you to plan out, um, like a plan, basically for your, your imaging plan. So here, you know, this person has got, you know, 300 second exposure set up, he's going to do 20 of them. And then after that, he's going to do a three minute exposure and do 20 of them. Basically, this allows me to, once I have everything set up, I can say, oh, do, do 20, 180 second exposures. And ideally, I can walk away at that point because the whole thing's automated now. The guiding's automated, the imaging is automated, and I can just walk away. You know, if it's cold in the winter, I can just go back inside and warm up. It's very nice. Um, but uh, so astrophotography tool in particular can connect to PhD2. It can connect to the guiding software and allows you to do something called dithering, which is very important because there is this really bad kind of noise that you get if you don't do the called walking pattern noise. And it's just this like, it's this streaked noise. I don't know if it's hard to see over Zoom, but it's like this streaked noise. And in this particular example, it's streaking uh, to the upper right and it's it's really hard to get really hard to um, remove in post-processing it's probably next to impossible but dithering like just removes this noise preemptively and so what you do with dithering is between your sub exposures you're just going to tell the telescope you're going to tell the mount rather to move in a random direction just a tiny bit such that your signal moves mere pixels between your sub exposures. And by doing that, when you go to stack all your sub exposures, this walking noise will kind of average out and you'll get like a, a smooth background. I'm not too certain like the specifics of how it works, but it, the walking noise basically averages out since in the, in the stacking, now it has to align all of the, the images. And since they're all slightly off, uh, the, the noise will be in different spots and it'll kind of average out. And so PH2, PhD2 does the dithering Dithering super important, hence the saying up here, dither or die, since if you don't do it, you're, you're going to get walking pattern noise. I had walking pattern noise in my early images, and when I discovered dithering, I'm like, why didn't I do this before? It was super easy to set up. All right, so calibration frames, you have darks. I talked about darks, so they deal with heat noise and, uh, and hot pixels, and dead pixels too. So you just say if I did a 300 second exposure for my, for my uh, light frames, I would take a uh, 180 second exposure dark frame and at the same temperature too, as I said before. Bias frames, you, it's like a dark, but except you um, take a, the shortest possible exposure your camera can do. So on my camera, the shortest is one four thousandths of a second. So I just set it to that. And what this does is it gets rid of a uh, horizontal and banding noise. And then you have flat frames. So if you have dust motes on your camera or there's a source of vignetting, Flat frames do this, uh, actually take care of this. And there's many methods of taking a flat frame. Basically what you want is a fairly lit up 
uh, field of view, uh, like a homogeneous field of view. And um, what I do for the flats is called the white t-shirt method. So I just, I just plop a white t-shirt over my, over my lens. I, you know, secure it with a rubber band and then I point it at an LED panel. And then what you have to also make sure to do is um, set the appropriate exposure time. So you light it up just enough to see the, the dust fans, but you don't want it to be too dark and you don't want to blow it out either. So there's, there's, a, there's like a, a, a balance point in your exposure time. So stacking, I've been talking about this. So once your, your individual sub exposures that come out of the camera are bad, they are not good. They have a crappy signal to noise ratio. And so you have like, I don't know, 40 or 50 sub exposures lying around and they're all bad. So with stacking, what we're gonna do is we're gonna integrate all of these frames together to create one image with a good signal to noise ratio. And so there's, bunch of, there's a bunch of random noise in each of your sub exposures that darks won't deal with, that bias frames won't deal with, there's just a bunch of random noise. So stacking is you integrate these frames all together and the, and the random noise kind of just averages out into a smooth field. And so basically the more frames you stack, the better your signal to noise ratio is. Although at a certain point you get diminishing returns with stacking, it's not, it's not like linear. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the software I use. It's called Deep Sky Stacker. It pretty much automates the process for me. You put your picture frames in, you put your dark frames in, your flat frames in, your bias frames in. It knows what each frame is and then it registers the images and it stacks them for you. It makes it really simple, but still the, Im the stacked image you get out of it is still pretty bad. As you can see on the bottom image here, this is an example of a stack frame that I usually get. You can't really see what I was trying to image. You can see stars in there and it's really green just because of the uh, Bayer pattern on my, on my color camera. You get two green pixels for uh, every four. So yeah, it, it's not very great, but what we do is we do post-processing of course. And so I'm at, when the slides are over, I'm gonna do a short uh, a demo. I use Photoshop for post-processing. So this was just a stacked image I showed and this is the result after a couple hours of post-processing. So this is Thor's helmet, uh, really cool object. So I've been talking about <laughs> astrophotography and I do it from Newark, Delaware. And so it's like, well, how do you get around the light pollution? I haven't talked about light pollution. So astronomer's wor worst nightmare goes on a scale from one the best to nine the worst. Here in Newark, it's a Bortle class seven. So we're pretty bad here. Um, in Cherry Springs State Park in Pennsylvania, I've always wanted to go there. They hold an annual star party. Um, I was planning on going this year, but then it got canceled again. I didn't have any finals in the way. It was looking good. And they canceled it again, so whatever. Um, it's a Boreal class two, so that's very good. And it's probably the darkest spot on the east coast of the US, which is why I want to go. It's only five hours away. So um, light pollution will probably only get worse from LED headlights or yeah, LED headlights and LED lights in general since they emit broadly, at least the, um, the street lights I have in my neighborhood, they're like the sodium vapor lights, they like the um, yellow orange light, you can get around that. But with LED lights, they emit broadly across the whole visible spectrum and you're kind of screwed, there's nothing you can do. But for now, there are ways to get around light pollution and the way to do that is through filters, okay? So mainly there are two kinds, we got broadband filters and narrowband, they're essentially polar opposites of each other. So Broadband filters, um, they let in, they let through most light while blocking out specific wavelengths of light. And narrow band filters, they only let in a specific wavelength of light blocking everything else. So typically they have these light pollution filters. Um, these are broadband. So they'll, tar they'll block out wavelengths of light that you know, are associated with light pollution and let in everything else. So this is a transmission curve of a light pollution filter, the one I use. Um, so the, re uh, the transmission curve is in red and then you have the orange spikes, which are um, uh, light pollution wavelengths and then relevant uh, nebulae emission lines, which are still let through, which is good because you want those. Um, but <laughs> there, there are no substitute for uh, dark skies. So I, I use a light pollution filter when I image galaxies since they're broadband targets, it would be, you can use narrowband filters for galaxies, but typically I, I use a broadband filter for galaxies and it's just, it's just no substitute for dark skies. I, I, I would bet I would get much better results 
imaging a galaxy from a dark sky site with no filter at all than imaging a galaxy from light pollution with a light pollution filter in. So I haven't done it yet, but I would bet. Um, and then narrow band. So the three most common narrow band filters, of course, you have H alpha, which targets H alpha light. And then you have oxygen three and then sulfur two. Um, and you would use these filters with a, a monochrome camera, these, these single bandpass filters with a monochrome camera. Because with H alpha light, you're essentially only letting red light through. Um, if you were to use an H alpha filter with a color camera, well, you know, you, only the red pixels letting in light and the blue and green are essentially kind of useless. And so there's really no point for using a single band pass narrow band filter with a color camera. Yeah, so more about uh, narrow band filters. You can create color images with narrow band filters. So uh, the famous Pillars of Creation by Hubble is a uh, narrow band false color image. So what they did was they took they took pictures it with H with an H alpha filter. They did it with oxygen three, and then they did it with sulfur two, and then th they used some called the Hubble palette, which they put the H alpha. Uh, picture in green, they put the sulfur two in red, and then they put the oxygen uh, three in in blue. And so you normally what you get is like a really green image, like um, because of course you put hydrogen alpha in green and that's the most prevalent wavelength of the whole nebula. So it's gonna look really green. And so they do some processing techniques. I've, I haven't processed the narrowband image, so I, I can't quite say what they do, but they do like a lot of green reduction in the image to get rid of like the head really green image and the green of course is like a color you don't see in space it's really unnatural and you also get purple stars again purple stars just don't exist so green and purple the most unnatural colors in space probably so that's that's quite why they're called false color um but yeah i just to compare this is my take on the eagle nebula with the pillars of creation this was done with a, my dedicated astronomy camera and i used a a smaller refractor three inch refractor with a uh, focal length of 480 milliliter, or milliliter, millimeters. Um, and so obviously it's a wider field of view. You can see the surrounding nebula around the pillars of creation, but still pretty cool that you can see that um, from my front yard. Um, yes, so though I'll say right now, I did use a narrow band filter for this picture of the Eagle Nebula and it's in true color. And luckily um, we have multi-pass narrow band filters. So, you know, with an H alpha filter, you're, you're only letting in 656 nanometers. Um, with dual narrowband, you can do two. And that's the one I use with my camera. Um, I use a filter that simultaneously allows um, H alpha light and oxygen three. So this, this nice spike here, that's H alpha. Then this not so nice spike is oxygen three. And so with that, you can actually get a narrowband image in true color with a one shot color. And you, ta you target wavelengths of light coming from the nebula while ignoring light pollution. And so that's mainly how I can get pretty decent uh, photo photos of nebula f with light pollution is with these dual narrowband filters. This is pretty much the key. Um, so, and then I, I use a dual narrowband pass. And then of course there's a tri-band pass. And then, yeah, there's a quad band pass too, which does H alpha sulfur two oxygen three and H beta all at the same time but it costs a thousand bucks. So I'll, I'm going to stick to my, my duo narrowband filter for now. <laughs> oh, and so this was, this was for the, the uh, observational astronomy class. I, I did my process using uh, Deep Sky Stacker and um, Photoshop on Mount Cuba images just to see what I would get. And I, I think the um, results are pretty decent. Oh, yeah, and further reading and cool people, Trevor Jones at Astro Backyard. He's the one who really inspired me. I found his YouTube channel in 2017 when he was just starting. Uh, well, he didn't just start doing astrophotography. He just started his YouTube channel. But he's, he was doing it from like the suburbs of Toronto. And I was like, wow, you can actually do this. I was pretty amazed by his images back then. Um, so he's, he's the one who inspired me. If you're interested, I, just, just check him out. He makes some pretty high quality videos these days. Dylan O'Donnell, he's another one. He's in Australia. I guess that's cool. And then this one, how I took a picture of a galaxy. I really liked this video because this, this was posted back like in 2020, last year. Back when I was pretty, I, I knew the whole process of astrophotography. I knew what to do. This guy, he just, non-astronomer at all, no experience in astronomy whatsoever. Just the question pops into his head. I was like, can I take a picture of a galaxy on Earth from my backyard? 
And so it's just a, a video of him going through the whole process. Like it was, I admit it was kind of fun watching him struggle a little bit and complain. So I'm like, yeah, I went through that too. I knew that I knew what you're going through. So, well, this, this is the end of slides, not the end of the presentation, but here are some of my images. So, um, let's see. So I, this Crescent Nebula, I took that last summer over I Nebula, I took this. This was my first picture of with my bigger scope. So I got my five inch refractor well, basically near my birthday in February. So this was, this was the first real good image I got with that telescope. There was a bit of a learning curve to it. Um, yeah, and so you can do galaxies too. I got the Leo triplet in, Andr in Andromeda. It's not a total waste of time um, from, from light polluted skies because with, with all these nebula photos, I use my dual narrowband filter. And so I basically was ignoring light pollution. With these, with these galaxies, I was using a, a light pollution filter, a broadband, and so you know, it, it's doable galaxies. So now I'm going to do a quick and dirty processing of an, a stacked image um, in Photoshop real quick. So let me get that up right now. Okay, so you can all see this Photoshop, right? Um, this, is a, this is a stacked image that comes out of Deep Sky Stacker. Um, and it, it's really green as we saw before. And it doesn't look like there's much in there. So what I'm going to do real quick is Deep Sky Stacker spits these photos out as a 32-bit file, and I can't do anything with that. So I convert it to a 16-bit. I'm going to crop it a little bit since they're stacking artifacts. I don't know if they're called all artifacts, but they're uh, near the edge of the frame since I dithered. Um, and then here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a levels adjustment. So here, this, is, this here is the histogram of the image. It shows the pixel value on the horizontal and then the number of pixels on the vertical. And then we have our black point here, our midpoint and our white point. And so on the very left, you can see there's no data. And so we, we have, our, by default, our black point is at a point where there's no data. So we're gonna click on that black point. We're gonna drag it to where the data just begins. And that's gonna darken the image a little bit. Um, and what I wanna do is I want to get rid of this green. And so in this drop down menu, you can select the channel. So by default, it's on RGB. I'm going to go to green. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to bring that black point to, the, to where the data begins. Okay, and now it's really blue. So I'm going to do the same thing in the blue channel. What a surprise there. That's looking pretty good. Okay, so now, now it's somewhat color corrected. I do color correcting throughout the whole processing process um, because what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do a curve stretch and this is where the magic happens. So you can see our histogram here and our histogram, all the data is on the left. So that means our image is really dark as you can see. And this line here, this is our, it's linear, but what I can do is I can click and drag and I can make it non-linear, non-linear curve stretch. And this is just gonna globally brighten everything up. And so now it's looking a bit better. Um, the data is starting to come out and it's still a bit green, so. I have to, I never process the same image the same way. So <laughs> bear with me here. I'll leave that where it is. Okay, so now that now the data is starting to pop out and what I've done like four steps. So guess what we're gonna do again. I'm gonna do another curve stretch. Start at where the, uh, the data ends here. I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna do a nonlinear curve stretch and the data is gonna pop out. And I practice this. I hope it turns out fine. If it doesn't, I have my completed image. But uh, it's still green. It's pretty yellow. I'm just going to go one step at a time. And now it's really red. OK, so there we go. OK. There, you can um, color balance it with this gray dropper tool. I used to do this. It's just click right here, click anywhere on the image, and it'll do its best. But Typic, right now, I, at this point, I do it manually just because I have the control. I just want to get this right fine. That's all right. And so did another levels adjustment. Guess what? I'm doing it again. I'm doing another curves adjustment. And now the data is really popping out. But if I do, if I do the curve stretch too much, I'm going to blow out the background sky. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to blow out the background sky. It's still too green. That's fine. So already, I mean, you can 
definitely now see what I took a picture of when before <laughs> it's a green mess. Um, so at this point, um, what I what would I do? I, I could probably get away with another curve stretch, but you probably get the point at this point. So at, at this point, I wouldn't want to do any more curve stretching because I don't want to blow out the background sky. So this is a really powerful tool in Photoshop. I go to select color range, click anywhere on the picture, gives me what's selected. I'm going to click OK. And now it shows me what's selected with, it's called the walking ants. I'm going to go into select, select and mask. I'm going to feather it so the boundaries aren't so uh, discreet or whatever you want to say. I'm going to shift the edge to change it. And now it's selected a specific part of the nebula. And now I can do a specific curve stretch, just brightening up the nebula and nothing else. And so this, I do this a lot. This, it's such a powerful tool to just only be able to brighten the nebula while leaving, well, you, you still kind of affect stars, but you leave out, you leave the sky, background sky unaffected while brightening the nebula. And so, you know, you, you you can do everything, you can do vibrance, you know, you can boost saturation, not too much, obviously. But yeah, I mean, you can do a lot with Photoshop. I'm typically wary when I tell people I use Photoshop, it's like, oh, you faked it. Like, no, I, I only, I simply brought out the data that's already in the image. And, you know, you can do some really wacky stuff in Photoshop that's just unrealistic, like this hue slider. Oh, look at that. You can turn it green if you want. But I use the hue slider very sparingly because I, li I like my nebula just a bit pinker rather than redder. So just a little bit. And so, yeah, that's basically what I do. Um, I'm not going to be, <laughs> normally it takes around two hours to process an image. And then I spend like two hours after that, just looking at it, see if I like it. And then you can do, oh, okay. So you can do selective curve stretches. If you c control click on a nebula, then control click on the, on the, uh, the background sky, you can, brighten the nebula that way too and so yeah that's that's a uh, about it i mean there's there's some tool called camera raw filter there's some i call the miracle slider it's called it's the clarity slider it just makes the image better it brings helps out bring detail um but um yeah i would spend two hours on this so obviously i'm not gonna this is a you could consider this a completed image all on its own but um, this was my take. This was, you know, two hours worth of uh, pr processing. I did other things like um, select uh, selective sharpening. So I really wanted to highlight all, all these dust lanes here. And so what, what I did was I created a new layer. I, re I over sharpened it to the point where it was just ugly and then you can mask it. So I hit it with a mask and then I can just erase the mask away and revealing like the sharpened dust lanes here and that's that's how i brought these out the dark spots um so yeah and then what else i don't want to keep it much longer but one thing i do is when you sh when you do your curve stretches your stars get bloated and really big and it can start to take away from your image so there's an easy way to do that you do your color range again click on a star in the middle now it's going to select your stars only and so and then it doesn't select the whole star. So I go to expand. I tell it to expand by two pixels. And then for good measure, I feather it too. Okay. And then you go to filter minimum. And then if you can see there, it might be hard to see on zoom. Um, you can see, select the radius and you don't want to do too much. You just want to decrease the stars by a little bit. And so that, that decreased the stars a little bit. It minimizes them just a bit. And another thing I can see in these images is that with this duo, bar duo narrowband filter I use is you have hydrogen alpha at red and then oxygen three at 500, which is smack dab in the green channel. Um, and so what you get is you get red stars, stars that are red come through red, but blue stars don't come through blue. They come through green, <laughs> like this turquoise color. And so that's really not, I don't like that. So you could try color correcting them. But what I do is I go to camera raw filter again. There's like a green fringe tool. It's called lens corrections. I could just take that. Now that now my green stars are now colorless. So um, I, guess, I guess it's better than green, but anyway. So, I mean, that's about all I got. Um,
if there are any questions, just let me know.